Today's scripture is from Exodus 14, verse 5 through 12. <clears throat> when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he, has his, he had his chariots made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with him and other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the Sea of Phi Harioth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that brought you, that, that you brought us to this desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be, be to God. God. Well, good morning, church, and it's great to be on this Sunday with you. Hello to those online as well. Thanks for being with us. Those that will watch this later, thanks again for also being with us as well. well we are uh, in a story, and I'm so glad that you're all here today. You know, um, one of the things that I just got to say as a pastor, what makes me sad is, believe it or not, the Sunday after Easter is the lowest attended Sunday in services all year round. In fact, they call it, pastors, we call it low Sunday and uh, it's always been one of those things, I just look at the American church and I go, that is the weirdest concept ever. You just celebrated Easter, the risen Lord, and the next week you're like, yeah, I'm going to take off. I'm going to, you know, I've got some things to do, right? It just never made sense to me. And so I just want to thank you, church, because I'm, I'm just pumped up here today because I look around and I see, you know, you all didn't take this Sunday off. Uh, and I know a lot of you may be traveling or something like that for vacations and all, but uh, thank you for watching with us. Uh, and that just makes me happy because I know uh, 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 our worship of the Lord is is not something that just happens, you know, a couple times a year on a special Sunday, but, you know, the Easter is all year round, right? And uh, to be celebrating with you here today is uh, just a phenomenal thing to do, and I thank you all for being faithful to the Lord and being here today and being with us. Well, let's pray together uh, a prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, as we're here today, I have to admit that uh, this is one of the, the most fun stories in the Bible, and, and for many different reasons. Of course, it's just an amazing story, and the great deliverance of the Israelites, one of the, the pivotal stories of all, all the Scripture. And I talked about how before, you know, the plagues of Egypt and the Passover is such a pivotal thing. It's the basic formation of the people of Israelites. But this story here today is really considered part of that, right? And so these aren't kind of two separate stories, but when they remember the Passover and the Israelites would remember this for generations to come, they would remember this whole story, including what happens today of the parting of the sea, as the story of how they were formed, how God had just worked in their life, and how now they were just devoted to this Lord, right? That God had worked in their life, they needed to be faithful to the Lord because God had worked in their life, and you see it echoed through all sorts of scriptures. I mean, especially like the Psalms, for instance. When you read through, you're going to see all sorts of references to the parting of the sea, the humbling of Egypt, the, the Passover itself, all these different things over and over and over again, right? Because this is, again, God's mighty work, and the Israelites remembered it from the years to come, would celebrate it as this great story of the Lord working. Now, remember, we're in the big picture story, though, is that God is trying to redeem the earth or trying to redeem all the world, and so he's chosen, again, this family, and that's now become a nation, and not only has this nation become his and become wholly his, but also he's sent them now and formed them through this time of trial to understand how mighty he is, how much he's for them, how much he loves them, how much he cares for them, and how much he's not going to stand for the atrocities that go on in this world, but is going to open up his hand and act when these things happen. And they go on for some time, but eventually the Lord's hand will be against those who do evil in this world. 
And so through this story, of course, the Israelites themselves understand it for them. But as we read later in the story, the people around them are going to say, who is this God? <laughs> right? And they start fearing the Israelites. And the fear of the Lord sort of becomes the beginning of wisdom. And as we go through the scripture, you're going to see how different peoples, they come to this point and they say, hey, I'm going to abandon my own tribe. I'm going to become an Israelite, right? And you see the Lord start to work and do these mighty works in people's lives. That's going to, of course, become a greater story that goes on. How God's holiness is going to be known, so to speak, through the Israelites and through their story that other peoples of other places could come to know. Again, Jesus Christ eventually, but at this point, the Lord himself on these times. Now, as we're going through it, um, what I want to focus today on is this story is is it's hard for me as I preach this because there's so many good things to talk about in these stories. And in fact, uh, this is one of those, um, I, I love the like Indiana Jones movies. I don't know if you guys like those, right? Or like the National Treasure movies or like anything that's got that like adventure kind of, you follow the clues and you go find things and piece things together. Um, just to let you know, this is one of those stories that uh, scholars of all types have tried to pin down when and where and what was the path and all these things like that. And the simple truth at the end of it is, nothing truly fits well enough. There's, there's sort of all sorts of theories and, and hypotheses, if you will. There's, for instance, you know, uh, when Israelites left Egypt, did they go through the northern route of Sinai? Did they go through the southern route of Sinai? The parting of the sea, right? Uh, we call it the Red Sea. That's because of the Greek. When the first Greek translation translated this, they, they translated it the Red Sea. But the original Greek, or the original Hebrew, that is, actually says Reed Sea, right? So the original Greek, uh, Hebrew says the Reed Sea, which... We don't know what the Reed Sea was. And in fact, all these places that are mentioned in this are kind of like the very out-of-the-way places of the, of the ancient world. In fact, there's like nothing left of them. So you can't really guess where some of these places are, even though it's very specific in the scripture. It says they went here and then here and they camped here and then went there and all these things. But we don't know, right? Because those places are just totally lost to us. In fact, you know, there's been so much development in that part of the world and so many climate changes over the centuries and different wars that have been fought where trees have been cut down and thus stuff has just changed. The bodies of water that were there don't exist anymore, some of them, right, <laughs> in modern day. And so this makes it very difficult to go back and to find these things. And this other simple truth is that uh, um, the ancient Near East cultures, when they lost wars, they didn't really talk about it, right? <laughs> Unless the other group talked about it, right? And so if, if, when historians go back and look at this, a lot of times they like to compare, you know, other ancient Near East uh, documents and things with Scripture. And the simple truth is, is when you get outside Scripture, there's almost nothing really talking about at this time. And so, you know, you get kind of this lull in history, if you will. And so there's this great question of, you know, who was the actual Pharaoh when this happened? What was the actual path that this happened? Where is actually Mount Sinai when this takes place? And you can come across and, get, and delve into the rabbit's hole, if you will, of just theory after theory after theory, which, of course, in seminary is like just our bread and butter, just sitting there like trying to figure these pieces out. But I'm here to tell you, church, at the end of the day, there's an element where you have to say, well, it's probably one of these, but we don't know which one, right? And that's just kind of the simple truth at the end of this. And so there does come, um, you know, some interpretation points of this that kind of come important of which one of those is true. But here's what we do know and what it says, uh, in fact, in Scripture, is that when this story takes place, and what I want to focus on here today, the Israelites had just seen the mighty works of the Lord. They had plundered the Egyptians. They ran off with their silver and their gold. They had their flocks and they had the blessing. And they're just celebrating. And the next minute, they are complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining. In fact, this whole part of the story, you know, we think of the Red Sea and all these things. But if you were going to sum up this section of the story before you get to sort of, you know, Mount Sinai, it is really, if you want to sum it up, it is the hard-headedness of these people, these Israelites, because time and time again, they've seen the Lord come to their aid and rescue them, and they turn around time and time again, and they are the most unthankful, just disheartened people. Like, they, they accuse Moses, they accuse Aaron, they just, they argue with them, they grumble all the time, and they do all these different things, and it's just story after story of these Israelites just grumbling, right? I mean, they've had the grand turkey dinner placed in front of them, and they're just like, yeah, but you know, I don't have the gravy, you know, I mean, it's like, it just, it just comes across as just the most ridiculous stuff ever. And so as we go through the stories, I wanted to kind of focus in on that instead of kind of doing some other things. Of course, the Lord's going to work in mighty ways with doing the red uh, parting of the sea. But as we're here today, you know, I just want to focus in on this, this aspect that the Lord can work in our life and we can be totally ungrateful for it. The Lord can work, and church, hear me, the Lord can work in our church 
And we can be so busy grumbling and, and just disheartened and just focused on the negative that the Lord is just going to be like, what in the world is with y'all, right? It can happen, and, and it can happen, and, in, and if we're not careful with our hearts, it can happen to each and every single one of us. And if we don't guard our hearts and focus in on what the Lord is doing and trust in Him, we're going to find ourselves grumbling to the point when you get to the end of the story, I'll just cut ahead a few, few jumps here from the sermons. When you get to the story, the Lord finally says, enough with you. You guys can just stay in the desert. Your generation is going to not see the promised land, and I'll bring the next generation in, right? And so, but it starts, you're going to see it start in this story, and that's where eventually this goes. But if we're not careful about our hearts and guarding our hearts against negativity, guarding our hearts against grumbling, guarding our hearts against doing what our culture does, is just going on that rage path, if you will, and getting on social media and just blasting somebody or, you know, doing all the things that we just tear people down or tear our leaders down or do whatever we do, you know, all those things can lead to not experiencing the full blessing of the Lord, even though we're the Lord's people. And the Lord's trying to do his best to bring us around. And so there's a great warning that happens in this story. So as we go along in Scripture, you're welcome to just follow along with us. We're going to be starting, of course, in that chapter 14 and just kind of highlighting a few things as we go through. As we read in that Scripture, of course, what happens with Pharaoh? The Lord had said it. Remember, he says, I'm going to harden his heart. Again, if you weren't with us in the previous weeks, I just want to remind you real quickly, that doesn't mean that the Pharaoh was just totally neutral and the Lord said, I want this guy to be a jerk. I'm going to make him a jerk. That's not what that means. Remember, what it means to harden someone's heart is to make them more determined on the path they're already on, right? To have follow through on what they're doing, so to speak. And so when the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart, it doesn't mean that he chose for him the path. It means that the Pharaoh already had this in his heart, right? He already wanted to go back and get these Israelites, even though he had been decimated. He wanted to get his slaves back, have the power back. And so even though he let them go, there's this desire in him. And the Lord says, I'm going to harden that desire enough that you're going to follow through with it. And so, of course, he and his officials look around they go, what are we going to do without these slaves? What have we done? And so they go flying after them on the fastest things they got. They got the chariots. It talks about how they got 600 of the best chariots, right? Which, of course, again, if you weren't with us with our children's moment, we have these little spaghetti wheels here today, uh, which, of course, again, if I go over on, on sermon, you can get a little munchy here and you can eat it if you need to. But uh, we got plenty more in the back. But we got these little spaghetti wheels that look like this, these pasta wheels. And it's supposed to remind us about the chariots, right? The wheels that were on the chariots. Which again, this is the unbeatable force in the ancient Near East at this time. This is the, the, the trump card, if you will. This is the nuclear option, right? Where no one has anything they can do against you unless they got chariots themselves. Which, of course, the Israelites and really none of the people in this part of the world do have these, right? And especially on the scale that the Egyptians have. The Egyptians have dominance in every single way. And it talks about how the Lord actually led the Israelites. Instead of going up, um, if you follow this and kind of, if you look at a map and you look at kind of the, the Mediterranean coast of Egypt through Sinai, if you will, up to, up to Jerusalem and that, or up through Israel, uh, there was a main road. It was called the King's Road, and that was the main road that would go through of all the trade. The problem with that is there was fortification after fortification of the Egyptians on that road. And so it says very specifically that the Lord actually led the Israelites away from that and took the southern route through the wilderness, if you will, through this time. And so they go on the southern route uh, through this instead of going through fortification after fortifications. So they're not able to be trapped, so to speak. There's no way to get you know, them st stuck with these fortifications. They're out in this wilderness. And then it talks about at one point the Lord even leads them backwards right, before leading them forward. And of course, in that leading them backwards is when Pharaoh and his army catch up with them. And you remember what those words said. And, and if you're sarcastic here today, you're going to love the Israelites because they're just I mean, there's so much sarcasm in all their comments that are going to be said here today. There's very few that are just straightforward. They're, they're like that backhanded, like, like kind of, you know, kind of thing uh, here today. But you remember what they said. It says that when they were there and they saw the, the Pharaoh chasing after them, they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die, right? You see the backhandedness of that? I mean, they were so, it wasn't just grumbling. I mean, they're just being, they're just giving it to Moses here right? What have you done? You've let us, leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. Why wouldn't you just let us do that? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. No. In the moment, you can think, well, yeah, I understand where they're coming from, but remember that what they just saw. <laughs> they just saw the ten plagues of Egypt. They just saw the Lord and worshiped the Lord and did all these things and celebrated on the way out. And their faith is already so frail and brittle that they choose this grumbling and choose not to trust the Lord or even trust Moses and to complain and to, and to do all these things. And of course, 
Lord does his mighty thing, right? Gets that pill. He's already been leading him by a, says a, you know, a, a kind of dust cloud, if you will, in the day and a fire cloud by the night as they were walking through. And so that fire cloud just comes and gets in the way of the Egyptians, blocks them off for a minute, and then Lord just works, right? And it's just one of these moments you're like, all right, when the Israelites see this, they will never complain again, right? It talks very specifically. You know, there's lots of theories and stuff you can get into all this about the parting of the sea, but it talks very specifically in Scripture that when it happened, there were walls of water on both sides, right? And they're walking through dry land, right? I just can't, I mean, just to think about what that looked like at the day. And they walk through on dry land. They get to the other side, of course, and they've seen this amazing thing. And, of course, what happens, pillar of cloud finally goes away, chariots chase after them. The Lord says, okay, whoosh, and the ocean walls come together, smash the army. This great army that's undefeatable, that no one can beat, is just wiped out in one just moment. And then it talks about how the people, and, and Moses has a song, they start singing the song, and there's a song of Miriam as well, one of the sisters, and they start singing and joyful and doing all these things. And you would think that, all right, this is good, people. The Lord's worked. The Lord's done a mighty thing. And guess what? Chariot wheels keep coming back in this, this story. Because the people get going for a little bit. The Lord's led them now into the desert. It talks about, and, and again, this is the desert of Shur, which there's some inkling to think that actually maybe this was actually more in Arabia than the Sinai Peninsula, because that's kind of where some of it refers to in other parts of Scripture. And so it may be the parting of the sea isn't like when you think of the Red Sea, it comes up and then Sinai splits it, right? And there's the Gulf of Suez and there's the Gulf of uh, Aqaba. It may be the Gulf of Aqaba actually where this parting of the sea takes place. You know, that's one of the theories that's out there. But again, nothing fits perfectly. And so as we're going through this, but they get to this other side, they get to this wilderness, they're going around and they get thirsty right? Because you're in the desert, of course that's going to happen. And so they start looking around and they start complaining, you know what I'm saying? They just do what they do because that's what they do. It says in chapter 15, verse 25, um, let's talk about Moses crying out, but right before that they go around and it says in 24, I'm sorry, so the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And of course Moses, there's this bitter water that's there, you know, it's that salty brine water kind of thing. And, and Moses, God says, hey, take this piece of wood and throw it in. He does miraculously it becomes this sweet water, fresh, thirst-quenching, drenching water. And so the people see this once again and drink it, and they see uh, where they're at, and they have these springs, and they, they stay there at the time. Of course, you go on, you say, oh, they've, they've seen the plagues, they've seen the parting of the sea, they've now got water, these people are going to be happy. Wrong, right? <laughs> right? Absolutely wrong. These people come together, and they start saying, hey, we're hungry. We need some food, Moses, right? You know, and in this story, you can hear again uh, the, what they say. They say, the Israelites, in chapter 16, verse 3, the Israelites said to them, if we had only died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Now, just think about how in the face that comment is. If the Lord had just let us die in Egypt. And here, think about their memory here for a second. This is how they remember Egypt. Now, remember, they were, Scripture says specifically, they were crying out to the Lord because of all the slavery they were in and the horribleness that they were in. And it says right here in Scripture that they, they cry out to, to Moses and them, and they say these things. Let us die. Why didn't let us die in the land of Egypt? There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, which probably was a very untruth, right? <laughs> that was probably not what happened. They were in slavery, and they, they probably had it occasionally, but it was not all the time. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death, right? Now, we're Meth you know, we used to be Methodist in the United Methodist Church, and all Methodist churches have you know, potlucks in common. I know you guys are probably getting hungry just thinking about food here, right? But they grumble, right? I mean, the ungratefulness of these people in this moment, and they keep turning on Moses, keep blaming him, and keep bringing it at him time and time again through this story, and, and the people, you know, eventually God says, okay, well, watch what my hand does, right? And he brings about manna from heaven, right, that comes across this dew. It's like this bready kind of stuff that kind of happens every single day, and, he, and it's fresh. Every single day, they're not allowed to keep it because it goes bad. You got to get up, and you got to get it every day. And so every single day, you're going to get up and see the mighty lower of the Lord, except on the Sabbath, right, where you're going to get some extra the night before. It's going to hold over. That one's going to be special. And then they get, not only that, but the Lord brings a bunch of quail, right? And makes them land down right by the camp where they're at, and they eat meat, just like they talked about. We had all this meat and stuff. They get their fill of meat. They get the manna. They get the water. They do everything that the Lord, or the Lord just continues to provide for them. And yet, in this, you never hear them say, wow, we were idiots. Uh -huh. Moses, we are sorry. <laughs> the Lord, we are sorry. We have been grumbling, and you have provided for us time and time again. 
in these moments. When we were in need, you met us. Then, of course, there's the one last story that happens that I don't want to touch here today, even though there's gonna, we're going to see this continue throughout more sermons. But they get water from the rock, right, in the story in chapter 17, where it talks about where, now get this, they've been grumbling. It talks about how they grumbled and they, they were just disregarded. But in this story, listen to what it says. So in chapter 17, the whole Israelite community set out for the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, where there was no water for the people to drink. Now, it doesn't say they grumbled. The word changes here. They quarreled with Moses and said, now they're not even being sarcastic anymore, give us water to drink. Right? And of course, the world works. Well, the Lord says to Moses, hey, go strike this rock. And he strikes this rock and this water pours out of it. We don't know if it was an aquifer or just the Lord did a miraculous work or whatever it was. But like the Lord told them, go find this spot. And he does it and they drink water, right? But you can see in this story already developing as we've developed here today, but it's going to keep on going where the people just are ungrateful. The Lord's worked in their life. The Lord's trying to shape them up. And remember, the whole goal of this is to make a holy nation that all the other nations would look at them and say, the Lord is good. I want to be with them and not my people. I want to ditch them. And my gods, I want nothing to do with them because this God is the God. And the Lord is just graciously pouring time and time again into these Israelites, his goodness and his faithfulness, and they grumble, and they grumble, and they grumble. And then they quarrel, and they quarrel, and as we're going to see, they disbelieve, and they disbelieve, and they choose other than God, right? The simple truth is I think there's a big warning in our hearts in this story is the Lord can do miraculous work. The Lord can rise from the dead himself and bring new life into our hearts, but if we sit there and we let this kind of culture in our hearts and our souls, if we let sort of this disobedient grumbling and let this, let this kind of attitude of just negativity and this attitude of just looking down and this attitude of quarreling with our leaders and, and just kind of ripping down whoever we can and especially getting to the point where we just quarrel with them, our hearts go on this path and just kind of like Pharaoh eventually, they lead us places we don't want to be. Right? And we miss out on the full blessing of God because of it. You know, when I think of these chariot wheels in the story, you know, I reminded myself of how evil Pharaoh was that the Lord just brought that justice upon him. But then I'm reminded so quickly how the Israelites themselves almost become what they left, right? And it started with that idea of that distrust in the Lord of looking kind of at the here and now instead of remembering and remembering what the Lord has done and applying it to their current situation. I always think in those stories and I'm reminded of you know, how this could have been different, right? They could have said to Moses, in those moments, hey, we're thirsty, but we know the Lord's faithful. Will you pray for us? Let's pray together. Let's let the Lord do a work because he's brought us out here. We trust that he hasn't led us to death for no reason. He's good and we believe in him, right? Which is how the story should have gone. And time and time again, they should have just been blown away by what the Lord had done. Because remember, they only sang songs right after the parting of the sea. When the Lord did these other works, there's no song sang. There's no joyful noise lifted up to the Lord. They just take and wait for the next time to grumble, right? And if we're not careful with our own hearts, this can be a warning in our own selves, right? That the Lord wants to do great in our life. He wants us to lift us up and make us, you know, a church that's a beacon to the rest of this world. But if we're not careful with our own hearts, and if we're not careful with that idea of, of again, grumbling and being negative and all these different things, the Lord can... can Sometimes we'll just be in the way of what the Lord wants to do, right? And again, just jump ahead, even to the point where the Lord will say, enough with you, you stay in the desert. I'm going to wait till your generation dies off. I'll bring the next generation in, and they'll see the goodness that I promised you. You know, the Lord is good, and he is patient. But there is, comes a point where we got to watch ourselves, because if we're in the way, the Lord is sometimes going to let us sit by the side. And the one thing I'm confident that of every single soul here today, you know, because you came the Sunday after Easter. This is low Sunday, right? You know what I'm saying? You came because you want to know the Lord, right? And you want the fullness of the Lord. And so I'm confident that you're here today and you want that. And so church, let us be the church that meets every hardship that comes across our way. Instead of grumbling, let's meet it with prayer. 
instead of grumbling, let's meet it with, with just uplifting each other. Instead of, instead of being quarrelsome like Moses experienced in that, let's, let's just lift each other up. And whoever's leading whatever ministry at that time, let's just ask, how can I help you? How can I come alongside you? instead of ripping that person down, right? How many times do we see this in churches of just go sideways because of these things? And it all started because people grumbled over the color of the carpet, right? Now, church, this carpet's old. It's held up good. But let me say, there's enough reason to grumble about the color of this carpet, right? But we're not going to do that, right? Because the Lord is working among us. The Lord is doing amazing things. The Lord is taking a cut-down oak and spurring life into it and breathing life into it once again to make it a great tree where all the birds of the air would come and be, find a home in. But we got to be careful. Because if we're not careful to, to glorify the Lord in each of the times He works in our life and be quick to do that and make that the kind of song of our heart and the way our hearts are tuned, there's a great chance the Lord will say, well, let another generation see it. None of us want that. We all want to be part of what the Lord is doing. And so church, I strongly encourage all of us once again to take on the heart of faith, take on the heart of encouragement, take on the heart of just trusting the Lord even when things get hard, to say the Lord is going to do this. And when we get to that moment where it's been three days, we've been without water, instead of grumbling and quarreling, we'd come together and we would say, Lord, you've worked, and you've worked in our past. We remember it. We celebrate it. And God, we're trusting in you in these days ahead. Let us pray together. God, we thank you again for your love that's constant and new every single day. And Lord, we don't deserve it in so many ways. Each and every single one of us grumble. Each and every single one of us see ourselves in these Israelites. But Lord, through your goodness and your mercy, you once again opened up a path for us to know you. And so God, as we're here today, we don't harden our hearts. But Lord, we let you soften them. So that God, as we come to your table here today, we would not experience not only, not, we would not only experience forgiveness and your presence once again, but we experience the joy of the Lord that even though times sometimes get hard, but your hand works when we get to the end of ourselves.